Hello and welcome back to Euphobia. Today's case is another doozy. What we find out about one case leads to many others in a connected web of murders and assaults across the South. So let's get into the story of the murder of Hannah Graham and the dastardly deeds of predator Jesse Matthew. Hannah Graham was an 18-year-old British-American student. She was born in Reading, England, but moved to the U.S. when she was five years old. She would eventually attend the University of Virginia, working towards a career in public health. When it comes to victims in this case, we're going to work backwards chronologically, so stick with me. On the night of September 13th, 2014, at around 1 a.m., Hannah was walking from a party in downtown Charlottesville on her way to another party. CCTV footage shows her wearing a gold top with cute pants and walking through their downtown mall, which is basically an extended outdoor shopping area with restaurants, bars, and things. Hannah had been texting her friends saying that she was not feeling well and getting a little bit lost. With each text, it got harder and harder to understand her because of how intoxicated she was. At 1.20 a.m., she would send her final text. CCTV footage would pick her up walking through the outdoor shopping center, and in the background, in the shadows, a man can be seen following her. Witnesses later reported that they had seen her at Tempo restaurant with a dude who did not look friendly, and it was apparent that she was very, very drunk, which was a problem for the restaurant because she was below the drinking age, but that's neither here nor there. There's another round of CCTV footage where she's seen coming out of the restaurant, stumbling and being held by his arm. The problem here is that his face was so obscured, all you can make out is this big presence next to Hannah, who is not a short girl. She was 5'11", and yet she's clearly not in control here. The last record of her is from a witness who reported seeing her standing outside of an orange 1998 Chrysler Sebring and drunkenly saying something along the lines of, I'm not getting in the car with you. And then she disappeared into the night. But before we go any further with Hannah's story, we need to jump back in time to 2009. Five years before Hannah's disappearance, 20-year-old Morgan Harrington went missing in the Charlottesville area as well. At the time, she was studying at Virginia Tech and went to a Metallica concert held at the John Paul Johns Arena in Charlottesville. She was meeting up with some friends who were from the area, and before Metallica even went on, at around 8.30 p.m., she left her friends to go use the bathroom. A bit of time would go by and she didn't return, so her friends started to get concerned. At 8.48, her friends called her, and that's when Morgan said something strange. Now, I don't know how, it's never been explained, but Morgan somehow ended up outside of the arena and was being denied re-entry into the venue, which absolutely sucks, I've been there. But Morgan told her friends not to worry about her and to enjoy the concert. She was going to find a way back home. It's unclear if she meant all the way back to her college, a two and a half hour drive, or back to wherever she was staying in Charlottesville. Either way, several people reported seeing her in the two parking lots of the arena after 9 p.m. They said that she seemed to be very intoxicated and had a gash on her chin. The last time Morgan was seen alive was 9.23 p.m. when she was seen on Copley Bridge trying to hitchhike and talking to a large man. Now, Morgan was supposed to go see her parents in Roanoke the next morning after the concert, and when she didn't show up and wasn't answering her phone, her parents got very nervous. Soon after, her parents reported her missing. Morgan's purse and cell phone were found, but I've read varying sources as to where it was found. Some say it was found in the parking lot of the arena, and others said it was found on one of the University of Virginia's athletic fields. One is a very likely option, and the other is slightly more troubling and logically harder, so I'll let you decide what happened. Anyway, her disappearance soon gained traction in the press, and volunteers came out to look for her all around Charlottesville. Less than a month later, on November 11th, Police received word that a bloody t-shirt was found outside of an apartment building. When they checked it, not only was it a Pantera shirt, a famous metal band like Metallica, but it was also tested and was confirmed to be Morgan's blood. 
It would be two months later before Morgan's remains were discovered by a farmer in a remote area 10 miles away from the John Paul Jones arena. The exact details of Morgan's body was never released because it was extremely violent. There's something that you know about the condition of her body that is quite disturbing, but maybe a very significant clue. Can you tell us about that? Yes, and, and I can't go into too much detail, but it is very apparent from um, seeing Morgan's remains. You know, she was killed in a fashion that was brutal enough to break, fracture her bones. The decomposition process had advanced so much by the time she was found that there was no soft tissue left, making it impossible to see the extent of her bruising. But many of her bones were broken and in some cases shattered. So you can see the violence immediately. Now, remember Morgan's story because I promise it's going to come back into play. But we need to jump back into time once again to 2005. Four years before Morgan's death in Fairfax, Virginia, a woman who was chosen to remain anonymous was attacked while walking home from the grocery store. She describes a horrific story of being dragged into some nearby bushes and being aggressively violated by a large man. She walked faster, then heard footsteps running behind her. Suddenly, she said he lifted her up and started carrying her. He dropped her, picked her up again, and then dragged her by her feet. She said he took her to a grassy area near some woods and threw her to the ground, sat on top of her legs and began choking her and slamming her head against the ground. She started to scream and he said to her, I will kill you if you do that again. At some point, she passed out from the terror, but woke up to a pair of headlights flashing in her face, and the man had run away in the confusion. After the initial shock had worn off, the woman had a rape kit done, but unfortunately, the DNA of her attacker was not in the database. But all was not lost. Because his DNA was then processed into the system, when Morgan's Pantera shirt was found, they not only found Morgan's DNA, but also that of her killer, and wouldn't you know it, but it was a match to the man who had attacked the woman in 2005. And this man was named Jesse Matthew Jr. Five weeks after Hannah disappeared, on October 18th, a call was made to the local police reporting that human remains were found on an abandoned property in Albemarle County. Not long after, they were confirmed to be the remains of Hannah Graham. Hannah Graham from Fairfax County, Virginia, uh, discovered October 18th. Her remains have positively been identified by the medical examiner's office, and we will keep you updated. The cause of death was thought to be suffocation or some sort of strangulation. But once again, the body was in a bad state of decomposition that it was hard to properly identify. The location of her remains was less than six miles away from where Morgan was found. After police reviewed the security footage of Hannah with a strange man, they identified Jesse Matthew as the man in the video. They tried to reach him for an interview, but he did not answer and soon went off the map. People in his life said that Jesse was acting very strange in the days following Hannah's disappearance. A co-worker said that he showed up late on the morning of September 13th and was incredibly cagey. He even had a swollen jaw and complaint of tooth pain. His apartment was searched and investigators found a cell phone with a SIM card removed that had not been used since September 13th, as well as a pair of shorts belonging to Hannah and her DNA on the inside of his passenger side door. But still, there was no sign of Jesse. He had fled the scene shortly after being tied to the case. On September 24th, he was spotted in Galveston on Gilcrest Beach, where he was camping out. A woman who saw him called the police because she thought he looked like the wanted picture that had been circulating in the area. Whether she was just being a Karen is up for interpretation, but who knows. He was found and officially was going to stand trial for the crimes he had committed over the years. Mr. Matthew, my name is Judge Henry. You have two charges this morning. You have got a fugitive from justice warrant out of Virginia for abduction of a person with intent to defile. You have got a Galveston County charge of false information to a peace officer. Your bond is denied on the Fugitive from Justice Warrant. Your bond in the Galveston County charge is $1,500. Do you understand that? Thus began the process over the course of two years of sentencing Jesse for his crimes. In October of 2014, he was indicted for the 2005 assault of the anonymous woman and eventually received three life sentences for it as well. 
On March 2nd of 2016, he pled guilty to two counts of first degree murder and two counts of abduction with intent to defile for the deaths of Morgan and Hannah, respectfully. In the end, he received seven consecutive life sentences instead of the death penalty. There's no chance of early release and he will never be eligible for parole. And while these are the cases we know about, it's thought that he's responsible for many other murders and assaults. With each of these crimes having several years in between, it seems like he was probably up to other crimes in between. It would later come out that he was accused of assault at two different universities, each time he left school immediately after the cases were reported. It's evident that offenders often escalate their crimes, and Jesse is a clear example of what can happen when someone does not face consequences. And that is the horrific story of the death of Hannah Graham and Morgan Harrington, and the dastardly deeds of Jesse Matthew Jr. Thank you for watching, and as always, remember these victims for who they were and not what happened to them. Remember to subscribe and give this video a thumbs up. Have a good night.